Welcome back to the series on the authorship and dating of the Gospels. We'll jump right into the Gospel of Mark. If you'll remember, in the introduction to this series, we heard from Martin Hingle. It must be asserted that in the present state of our knowledge, the titles of the Gospels are by no means late products from the second century, but must be very old. With a considerable degree of probability, they can be traced back to the time of the origin of the four Gospels between 69 and 100 and are connected with their circulation in the communities. Their ultimate root lies in the terminology of Mark, who was the first to call a writing euangelion, or gospel. And we're going to hear a lot from Doug Moo and D.A. Carson in this series because their work is very recent, and so they do a really good job of surveying other relevant data on this topic, scholars who have gone before them publishing on this issue. So let's review just a little bit more of what we covered in the introduction video as they go right along with Hingle. We have no evidence that these Gospels ever circulated without an appropriate designation, according to Matthew or the like. Papias, once again, comes down to us through Eusebius. It is in the following words, This also the presbyter said, Mark, having become the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately, though not indeed in order, whatsoever he remembered of the things said or done by Christ. For he neither heard the Lord nor followed him, but afterward, as I said, he followed Peter, who adapted his teaching to the needs of his hearers, but with no intention of giving a connected account of the Lord's discourses, so that Mark committed no error while he thus wrote some things as he remembered them. For he was careful of one thing, not to omit any of the things which he had heard, and not to state any of them falsely. Regarding the identity of the presbyter, and Papius quote, the importance of these claims is magnified when we realize that the presbyter Papias is quoting is the presbyter John, probably the Apostle John himself. If Papias is to be trusted, the identification of Mark as the author of the second gospel goes back to the first generation of Christians. Irenaeus states, Wherefore also Mark, the interpreter and follower of Peter, does thus commence his gospel narrative, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make the paths straight before our God. Plainly does the commencement of the gospel quote the words of the holy prophets and point out him at once, whom they confessed as God and Lord. Justin gives us an early reference to chapter 3 of Mark's gospel. He talks about Peter's name being changed in Mark 3.16. He says it is written in the memoirs of him that this so happened. And he also refers to the names of the sons of Zebedee being changed as well, referring to Mark 3.17. Tertullian says the same authority of the apostolic churches will afford evidence to the other gospels also, which we possess equally through their means and according to their usage, I mean the Gospels of John and Matthew, whilst that which Mark published may be affirmed to be Peter's, whose interpreter Mark was. And from Origen via Eusebius, the second is by Mark, who composed it according to the instructions of Peter. And finally, Clement gives the tradition of the earliest presbyters as to the order of the Gospels in the following manner. The Gospels containing the genealogies, he says, were written first. The Gospel according to Mark had this occasion, as Peter had preached the word publicly at Rome and declared the Gospel by the Spirit. Many who were present requested that Mark, who had followed him for a long time and remembered his sayings, should write them out. And having composed the Gospel, he gave it to those who had requested it. And we've seen over and over again the connection between Mark and Peter. And so if the early Christians wanted to assign the anonymous gospel of Mark to someone, Peter would have been a very good choice. He was an apostle. He was an eyewitness. Yet we find authorship of the gospel attributed unanimously to Mark. There seems to be no good reason for doing this unless Mark actually wrote the gospel. Regarding the connection of the mark mentioned by the church fathers and the mark of the gospel, that they refer to the John mark mentioned in Acts and in four New Testament epistles is almost certain. No other early Christian mark 
would have been so well known as to be mentioned without further description. Paul mentions Mark's presence with him during his Roman imprisonment. Peter, writing from Rome, also mentions that Mark was with him, calling him his son, perhaps implying that Mark had been converted through his ministry. Doug Moo and Don Carson conclude, Yet, as we have seen, there is nothing in the New Testament that is inconsistent with Papias' claim that Mark wrote the second gospel, and since we have no indication that anyone in the early church contested Papias' claim, we see no reason not to accept it. Now, with respect to Peter's influence on Mark, there is much internal evidence in the gospel itself that attests to the same. While found in all four Gospels, the picture of the disciples as cowardly, spiritually blind, and hard of heart is particularly vivid in Mark. This, it is held, points to an apostolic viewpoint, for only an apostle would have been able to criticize the Twelve so harshly. Now, Moo and Carson suggest three other factors that point to Peter's influence in the Gospel of Mark. Peter figures prominently in Mark, And then citing Dodd, there's a pattern of the gospel that's similar to Peter's words in Acts 10, 36 through 41, and Mark is called my son in 1 Peter chapter 5. Now, while this series is primarily concerned with authorship and dating of the gospels, let's continue down this trajectory just a bit further and look at Peter's role as an eyewitness in the gospel of Mark. Baucom notes in a recent article, After Jesus, Peter is much the most frequently named character in the Gospel of Mark. The point can be highlighted by observing that, although Peter is a prominent character in all four Gospels, the frequency of references to him in Mark is, in proportion to the length of the Gospel, the highest. Baucom also points out an inclusio with respect to how Peter is named in Mark's Gospel. Peter is both the first disciple of Jesus to be named in Mark's gospel and also the last. In 116, the first reference, the occurrence of his name Simon is emphasized by a grammatically unnecessary repetition of it. The last reference to Peter, after one might have thought Peter had dropped completely out of the narrative, is in the penultimate verse of the gospel, where the angel tells the women, Go and tell his disciples and Peter. Now, Balcom goes even further and says that Mark wasn't simply emphasizing Peter throughout his gospel. Rather, Mark was pointing to Peter as the main eyewitness behind his account. What the inclusio does is to confirm that Peter's pervasive presence throughout the narrative extends from the beginning to the end, making Peter's witness the overarching one for virtually the whole gospel narrative. Now, Balcom cites external evidence for this as well after analyzing the work of the ancient Greek historian Polybius. So the pattern of reference in this account of Scipio and Inclusio, along with the frequent reference within the narrative, forms a close parallel with the pattern of reference to Peter in Mark's gospel. In Polybius' case, he also makes it explicit that Laelius was his principal eyewitness source. Balcom says, I argue in the book, referring to his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, that in the early church there was a principle of eyewitness testimony from the beginning, stated in Luke, Acts, and John, i.e. that the most important testimony was that of disciples who had been with Jesus from the earliest days of his ministry and could testify to the whole course of events up to and including the resurrection appearances. The references to Peter in the Gospel of Mark clearly put him into that category. Let's move on to the issue of date. Blomberg, with a number of other scholars, puts the dating of Mark's Gospel sometime in the 60s. It is also important to observe that Irenaeus claims only that the transmission of the Gospel occurred after Peter's death, not necessarily its composition. But if Mark wrote during Peter's lifetime, and if the early church tradition can be trusted that Peter was martyred, under Nero before AD 68, then Mark must have composed his gospel at some still earlier date, perhaps 64 to 65, when Nero's persecution was beginning. Referring to the martyrdom of Peter and Paul, Irenaeus says, After their departure, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, did also hand down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. Peter. 
However, Clement seems to indicate the date of Mark's gospel could have been even earlier. And Peter makes mention of Mark in his first epistle, which they say that he wrote in Rome itself, as is indicated by him, when he calls the city by a figure, Babylon. Now, if we have our chronology right, with Peter being in Rome, then this could push Mark's gospel back even earlier, into the 50s. In fact, John A.T. Robinson has argued for a date in the 40s. We have scholars arguing for dates in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. I'll put a couple of names up on the screen for each respective decade. And you can see I have the 60s indicated as a majority. According to most surveys, I think that's where you're going to find uh, a large portion of New Testament scholars. Blomberg says, A date of somewhere in the 60s is probably our safest guess, without trying to narrow things down any more than that. So let's summarize what we've covered both in the introduction relevant to Mark as well as this video. It's improbable that the gospel could have been renamed from another author and distributed so quickly. The book is universally ascribed to Mark in ancient tradition. It's implausible to assign authorship illegitimately to a non-apostle. We have no indication that the gospel ever circulated without an appropriate title. We have numerous connections between Mark and Peter, and they're attested to both in the New Testament and in church tradition. We have multiple indications of Peter's eyewitness influence in the gospel, and we find Mark's gospel was plausibly written in the 60s, though substantial arguments for earlier dates have been advanced. So that's all for the authorship and dating of the Gospel of Mark. I'll see you next time for Luke. Thanks for watching.